Rethinking packaging means innovating at the design level to provide the same essential packaging function while designing out waste. Reuse models have gained significant momentum in the world of packaging. They can help to cut cost, build brand loyalty and improve user experience. Packaging design should seduce, inform and even save the planet. I'm Hernan Raberman and this is Branderman, the podcast where I talk with experts to uncover what it actually takes to make a positive impact on consumers, the market and society. Warning, keep this podcast out of the reach of close-minded marketers and designers. Before the interview, let me introduce my design agency. Brands with purpose. Human, agile, honest brands that leave no one indifferent. Tridimage creates and revitalizes brands to imagine and shape the future. Tridimage, the branding and packaging design agency for bold brands. Today I had the pleasure to talk with Jasmine Drafner, an industrial designer focused on circular systems and conscious materials, currently designer and developer for Loop. Her focus is on durable packaging design, long-lasting and circular recycling materials. In this episode, she tells me how durable and reusable packaging will revolutionize consumer experience. She also details the steps we should take to move packaging away from the current linear system, carving it into a circular system. Jasmine is passionate about creating solutions and connections between waste, design and biomimicry. Her personal work is centered on natural and biodegradable materials. Today, with me, Jasmine Drafner. Jasmine, each of us is a container of ideas, projects and dreams. However, we can't read the label when we are inside the jar. What do you think your label says? Or what would you like it to say? First of all, I'm hoping that I'm a glass jar and maybe the label is laser etched. I think that it would be an inspirational poem, something about strength, inspiration, and passion for my work. I think that's really what I'm always striving to do. I'm really interested in materials and sustainability at large. I think right off the bat, I have to say that materials are not inherently sustainable. So it's all about the context. So that's why I was saying that hopefully I'm a jar that is made of glass and the label is just etched into the material. I definitely want to be part of a, of a reuse system or at least a recycling system, you know, refilling all of that. I think that the context is even more important than just what my label says. Beautiful. Building a brand is like a journey. It starts with defining where we are and asking ourselves where we want to go. How was the path that led you from studying biology and later design to now focusing on circular systems and conscious materials? I have always felt very responsible for everything that I created. I was looking at, at an old journal from you know college days and I reminded myself of um, a time that I would build little wooden boats with a neighbor in Germany. And we would spend really hours building these you know, boats so that they would float correctly and be beautiful and good enough for a five-year-old to build. And it would just be a couple of seconds going down the stream. And it was all about the process for me. And it has always really been like that. You know, within biology, my mom's a biologist. So I was always really in tune with that and, and connected with understanding how things work and why are things a certain way that when I decided to go into design I actually started going into arts and and ceramics I was really into making functional ceramics and that's when I realized that maybe I could do industrial design because I was more interested in the material and the shape the ergonomics and the process of firing and glazing more than anything you know so that's how I really got into design and, and going from The biology aspect, I really just owed it to myself to also have a minor in sustainability and really focus on the materials. 
And like I said, it's always been about the process for me. And I think going back to that little anecdote with the boat, it's so interesting because that's a linear system, right? It's you make it, you put it into the stream and then it's gone and you never see it again. And I think that the majority really of manufacturing today is like that. And I think it's time for us to really think about where do the materials for the little boat come from? How is it built? Who's building them? What are the conditions of setting them go into the stream? And of course, functionality has to be there. Aesthetics, beauty, all of that has to be there. But thinking about the impact of the little boat on the stream and where is it going to go and is it really going to help it? I think that we as humans are smart enough to figure out a way to create things that are still bringing beauty and comfort to us. But we really need to figure out a way that we can do so that it adds to all the other species that are on the planet instead of taking away from that. That's really what always was my driving factor within biology and then also design and and where I'm now. How did you end up working at Loop? Well, I started working at Loop about three years ago. I first heard about TerraCycle. That's the parent company. They're a waste management company, really focused on recycling, hard to recycle materials, things like cigarette butts, like chewed chewing gum, used diapers, aluminum, plastic, chip bags, et cetera, et cetera. So I was really driven to that with the idea that things are technically recyclable and we need to find a way for it to make sense also from a business perspective. And when I first applied, Loop wasn't even public yet. And they told me, hey, you know, there's this really interesting opportunity. I think it would be a good match. So I moved from LA to Philadelphia. That was three years ago and have been working there since. It's been really interesting just to see such a different model come to life and, and be a part of it too. It's, it's really exciting. Can you please describe what Loop is? Yeah, so Loop is essentially a platform. It's an engine for change, right? And in this platform, all the products that are part of it are in a reasonable format. You know, so we're working with CPG brands, you know, Nestle, PepsiCo, Coca-Cola, It's the idea of bringing those products that everybody already knows and loves, but bringing it, it to the consumers in a reusable packaging format, right? So it's specifically about primary packaging. So not necessarily the cardboard surrounded. We're actually eliminating all of that already. It's really the packaging that is in direct contact with the product, that it should be reusable. And our platform is really assisting the brands in, in getting there and, and changing their packaging from single use to reuse. Loop really manages the back-end logistics and also the cleaning aspect of that. So we're really partnering up with DHL, FedEx, and also Ecolab. We're partnering up with everybody that's an expert in their own area, and we're putting all of that together to create a platform for reuse. And with anything that is a brilliant idea, you can really create other different avenues for that business to shine. So the first one was an e-commerce platform. We're now moving away from that and getting into the retail space. So we're working very closely with Carrefour, Walgreens, Kroger here in the U.S., Tesco in the U.K., Aon in Japan, Woolworths in Australia, and the list goes on. And the idea is to be live in these retail spaces so that people can go into the store and shop as they normally would but they can choose between the single use and the reuse version. We're also working now with uh, quick service restaurant businesses like McDonald's and, and also RBI. So that's also super exciting. So we're really looking at how this idea of reuse can really propagate over all different types of businesses. What wisdom have you gained in the process of leading the design department at Loop? A lot, honestly. It's just really interesting to see how our brands work internally. Everybody works a little bit different. Everybody has a different driving factor to be part of Loop. It's really interesting to also work with the manufacturers, right? Because my specific role is working with these brand partners, but as an intersection between the manufacturers. So we're essentially making connections between Unilever, Nestle, and manufacturers of glass, stainless steel, and plastic as well. And it's just really interesting to see all of them working together for the same goal. I've learned a lot about different types of materials that has been really exciting, bringing to the light to the manufacturers. Hey, you should be looking at this. You know, you should be investing in this specific material for reuse. You should be designing your products to be reused and not just to make them very cheap, very light because they're only used once. You know, we need to 
shift gears and go essentially in a different direction because we're trying to do something completely different. It's just really rewarding to be able to work with such a variety of brands. I specifically am working with food and beverage brands. The biggest wisdom that comes to mind is how working together can really bring to light innovation and changes in the status quo. How would you define sustainable packaging from this perspective? I think that sustainable packaging, like I said in the beginning, is all based on context. It doesn't matter if it is made of bamboo or apple leather, whatever. It needs to be part of a context of how are things being manufactured, who is manufacturing them, what is happening with them at the end of the life, you know, what is the LCA for that specific material and product? Can it be taken apart for recyclability? Can it, you know, be compostable and not compostable by some very rare industrial plants, but maybe in your backyard or dissolvable in water? And what does that mean for the water? So I think it's all about the context. I think that's the biggest aspect of it. There isn't like a material out there that's inherently sustainable. One of the biggest fallacies that I'm seeing today is how plastic is a villain on every single aspect of it. And I think that there's so much that is amazing about plastic, you know, and I think it's really not about the material itself. It's about the consumption model. It could have been stainless steel. It could have been glass. You know, they were manufacturing at crazy rates and not recycling, but it happens to be plastic for a number of reasons. I think it's about how we consume it and what happens to it that is accounted for. That's one of the biggest lessons I learned in the circular business, that it's not just about picking materials that are pretty and recyclable and all of that. You really need to account for every single packaging that you have because they're part of a larger system. So you're investing into that packaging, you're investing into that container, and you need to be able to account it within operations and even logistics of maybe a QR code or some type of code that really connects a specific packaging to a consumer, et cetera. So it's all about accounting and accountability of the materials and manufacturers and the brands as well. Wow. How will durable and reusable packaging revolutionize consumer experience? Basically, because brands are now investing into the packaging to be reusable instead of spending a couple cents on a PT or whatever HDP type of plastic or cardboard or aluminum, steel, etc. packaging, they can now really allocate investment for every and each packaging because it's meant to be reused, right? You're not just taking it from place A to B. You're really taking it to A, a to B, back to A, you know, going to the cleaner and all of that. There's so much more that involves who touches that packaging that it's important for it to be durable and it's important for that packaging to be cleanable. Obviously, it goes directly into design. The shape, the geometry, the architecture of the packaging needs to be durable and that is connected specifically to material, but also the design. It's about the geometries, the curves, et cetera, that need to be specifically designed for reuse and cleaning. And then when we get into cleaning, It's all about efficiency, right? Because technically speaking, anything is cleanable. You can stay there all day cleaning something by hand, but that's obviously not the type of skill that we're aiming for, right? We're looking to clean something very quickly, very efficiently. And of course, we need to clean it to very, very high standards. So again, that touches material because it's not every material that's able to resist our cleaning processes. That's why we're really focusing on glass, stainless steel, and polypropylene, you know, versus PET or HDP because they would melt in our process. But then because the brands are investing in that packaging, they can really also allocate not only the design thinking about the function of it that I just described, but also the function for the consumer. And from a marketing perspective, it's super exciting for the brands because that also means that they can reinvent themselves in front of the consumer, you know? Like how are brands perceiving that certain brand, how are they interacting with that packaging? Maybe there's some added features on the packaging itself. We have a really good example with Hagen Das, a custom container, three pieces, all one material, all stainless steel, permanent artwork, permanent label. And it's a container that's meant to be in consumer's hands and the ice cream just melts from the top down. So it's a much nicer experience that they don't really have to interact with melted ice cream, for example. And it's a double wall container, so it's not really cold to the touch. So those are very simple solutions that can be achieved through design when you're thinking about durability and when you can invest dollars, not cents, into a packaging because you're investing into so much else. And I think that's really where the consumer experience can change because brands are now 
looking at what is the experience the first time that packaging is being used? What is the 10th time? What is the experience the 50th time that someone is using that packaging? Is it changing? Is it getting better like a letter jacket? Or is it saying the same because they're a pharma company and they want everything to be pristine every time? And how do you achieve that also? Because we're also dealing with packaging getting scratched or dented. And how can we make so that the consumer also embraces that? And I think that there's so much that goes into that. We're really only scratching the surface. I'm really excited to see what designers and brands are going to come up with. Wow. How do you balance convenience with sustainability in this kind of new business models? One other thing that's really important to note is the reuse system that I described for Loop is not the only solution for a less wasteful planet, right? It's, it's only one solution. There's so many different other types of refill models where you refill in store, where you refill at home, or you don't refill at all because the brand is taking charge of that, which is what we are doing at Loop. There isn't just one silver bullet. It's about working together and finding different ways to tackle this massive issue that we have in our hands. With Loop, really what we're trying to achieve is to bring that convenience to the consumer in a sense that we're really trying to mimic the convenience of single use, right? You purchase something, you consume the product, and you throw it back to us. And instead of throwing it into a trash can or a recycling bin, hopefully you would give it back to us, either through a drop-off location or with the e-commerce platform, we even take it back from you via UPS from your home. We're trying to make it a seamless transition for a consumer. We also try to make it very exciting with the packaging. It's something new. And like I said, there's perhaps even additional features of using that type of packaging versus the lame single-use version, so to say. I think it's all about convenience and making it... Jasmine ambitions a world that is self-sustaining, for which she helps create intersections between unexpected materials and innate function. Easy for someone to opt in on this new system. Jasmine ambitions a world that is self-sustaining, for which she helps create intersections between unexpected materials and innate function. Do you think the day will come when packaging will be property and responsibility of the companies that manufacture and sell it, not the consumers? That's already the reality that we're working with. When you're participating in Loop as a consumer, you're paying a deposit per the container. And the idea is that you get a deposit back as soon as you return that packaging to Loop, you know, slash the brand. And, and in this system, the brand is really the owner of the packaging, which is why this is so such a big shift. It's really groundbreaking that the brands are owning their packaging throughout their whole life cycle within this reuse system. So that's why it's so important to really invest into the packaging and make sure that it is durable, that it is cleanable that it can survive a number of cycles in the platform. That's a big shift with Loop is that you're only borrowing, you know, you're renting the packaging from the brand. When you're getting that deposit back, as soon as you return the, the packaging. So it's not a new idea. It's just at a different scale and with uh, a lot of different products, not just milk. How is it possible to help brands and their leaders transition to a circular economy model? I think that the big shift that's happening in the last few decades is how the consumers are just becoming literate in packaging and materials in what sustainability actually means. And having that pressure from the consumers, I think it's very important for these brands to start making massive changes. I know from firsthand that there's a lot of brands that have a, a lot of people that are working that are very passionate about sustainability and also want to make the change. And like you said, how can we help the brands to make that? You know, I think from a consumer perspective, it's about continuing to pressure brands to make that change and staying on top of it and, and making sure that conscious materials are being used. And when I say conscious, that it makes sense in that context. And from a brand perspective, from a manufacturer perspective, I think it's the due diligence of where's that material coming from, how exactly it's going to be used, how can we take it apart or recycle it or compost it at the end of its life cycle. So I think all of that due diligence needs to really happen from both sides. Talking about convenience to get brands on board with reuse or quote unquote sustainable packaging, I think Loop is really doing that already, meaning that we are a platform where we are happy to engage with the brands and kind of hold their hands and explain to them our own standards and requirements for durability and cleanability and even offer them options 
through manufacturers that we have been working with. And like I said, explaining to them what we're trying to do and what are really the important pieces that they need to get to when we're talking about reusable packaging. When we see platforms like Loop, many of our listeners are from Latin American countries and we see those solutions like first world solutions. Imagine that a Latin American company approaches you because they want to make their packaging more sustainable. How would you help them? Where should they start? I think they need to start on the legislation piece. Loop is global and I'm currently working with brands in the US and Canada France, UK, Japan, Australia, and we definitely also want to get to Latin America, but we're not there yet. So I don't work too closely with brands in that dilemma, but I know through some friends that they were looking into doing something similar, like as a reuse platform. And there's a lot of legislation around that don't really let you take the containers back from the consumer because it's seen as a health hazard. So I think that's a really good starting piece, you know, to make sure that you can actually take dirty containers back and be able to clean them, or at least figure out a different type of refill solution where maybe the consumer is refilling at the store at their home to make sure that that is possible. It's also about understanding the consumption models and the interest of the population itself. It's always interesting to see like in, in the US, brands always go for much bigger bottles and jars. The portion's always bigger than the ones in Japan, for example. So I think also understanding what exactly would people really opt in for and what are people interested in paying a deposit for. I think that a consumer insights piece would also be really interesting to get started. Great. I noticed that you don't speak about packaging as being recyclable as the great solution. Why do you opt for reusable or durable instead of recyclable? Yeah, I mean, all of our reusable packaging also needs to be recyclable. I think that's just the very benchmark now. And having composite materials that are not recyclable is just not acceptable anymore. Over packaging is not acceptable anymore. So I think that having one or two materials being part of your primary packaging is acceptable, but really having a lot of different materials, meaning that it's hard to recycle, is already definitely a no-go and people need to move away from that. So that being said, I think recycling is really the benchmark and every packaging needs to be recycled at a very minimum. But then again, the idea here is that since it takes already so much resource to mine the material, create the packaging, the container itself, depending on the material, it, it can be a very long process, uh, not just injection molding, et cetera. So it, it takes a lot of resource on time. So if you're already creating that from scratch, why not use it as much as you can before you do recycle it? That's really the beauty of also working with the materials that we're working with, especially glass and stainless steel. Those materials are technically infinitely recyclable, meaning that, you know, definitely with glass, you can take the shattered glass and you can melt it and make the same container over and over again. So it's a really true circular system where you're not only using that resource as much as you can, but then you, as soon as the life cycle of that container has reached, you can also take that material. It's all about the business side of it too. It's not just, it's technically recyclable, but with those materials specifically, they are valuable enough that it still makes sense to recycle them. Stainless steel is so valuable that it makes sense to break it all down and make the same container over and over again. So we're definitely not there yet, you know, from a manufacturing side, but that's really the dream to be able to have not only a closed loop system for the consumers, but also a closed loop manufacturing system. What new materials do you think we will see in packaging in like 10 to 15 years time? I am so passionate about new materials and finding materials made from waste. I have a friend in Denmark and she started her own company. It's an apple letter business. So they take apples from local cider press factories. After all the juice is taken away from the apples, they have the, the rest of the apple, the apple pulp. So she takes that and makes an apple leather that is now mixed with other materials, also natural materials. She's able to make a leather piece that you can do clothing with, bags, etc. It's just so exciting to see that there's so much uh, value in our waste and that we're not really looking at all the different manufacturing systems that we have in place that are generating already side products. When we have to start looking at that as resources and not just from an environmental perspective, but also as a business case. Why would you be throwing that away if you could use it for a different thing? 
I really dream of having closed loop manufacturing systems, like I said, but that they would be also global in industries. It's a huge dream and, and I do hope that we get there over the next few decades. But I do expect that in the coming years, we're going to see more of uh, mushroom packaging, for example, other type of biodegradable materials and hopefully made of local waste. That's another big piece of it, right? So making sure that looking at maybe, you know, your local industry and trying to figure out what is produced here in large quantities and how could I reuse that? I did a few of those exercises as my graduation piece in LA and I ended up creating uh, a material that's a mix of coffee flour and fabric waste. And I did that so that it would stay together, kind of like a, a sturdy but flexible type of material to be implemented within packaging shipping. So you would be able to ship fragile items and it's all made of natural products that were all byproduct waste from the local industries. I'm really excited to see more natural materials being incorporated and especially materials from waste. And if there's a way that we can even integrate biomimicry into that equation, that would even be better. Just thinking about how systems work in nature and, and being able to incorporate that also in the actual design of the final product or even like in the fabrication of the material itself. <laughs> How should we compose a dream team of professionals to cope with a sustainable design challenge? It is so refreshing to be able to work with people from all over the globe, from all different types of backgrounds. That is definitely a huge part of finding a collaborative answer to this huge problem that we're facing. It's about collaboration and, and working together. Professionals really need to brace themselves with this huge task and challenge that we have ahead of us because it's about how can we really shift the gears completely from single use, from a linear system to thinking about resources and where they're manufactured and does it make sense to ship it all the way across the globe or can we invest in, in local manufacturing, et cetera. It's about being resourceful and having a thick skin to challenges. I have to tell you, I don't truly believe that we need to save the planet. That's the biggest lie ever, because obviously the planet has been around for way longer than we have. What we're really trying to salvage here is an environment that we, as we know it, can continue to exist. It is obviously very sad that so many animals and plants, uh, other species are dying because of the way that we like to live our lives. But I truly don't think that we're here to save the planet. How can we live in this planet and, and be really careful and grateful for what we're taking and find a way that we're, we can actually give back more than what we're taking back. Why is packaging feeding turtles instead of killing them? Well, <laughs> what is the worst packaging design crime you have ever witnessed or perhaps committed? <laughs> well, I think the obvious answer are those photos that everybody has seen of like bananas or apples wrapped in flexible plastic. I think that's just so dumb. <laughs> But like I said, that's an obvious answer. I think that a more thoughtful answer will be thinking about the composite materials that are out there. I've been seeing more and more, hey, you know, this sustainable packaging, it's made of wheat and polypropylene. And it's a mix of this paper or wheat, like I said, barley etc., of these organic materials mixed into the plastic. But, and then the idea there is that we're using less plastic and that's why it's more sustainable. So that is just so wrong in so many different levels. It's not about the plastic itself. I really don't think that a material can be a villain. You know, it's about the consumption model and the companies behind it, right, that are not being held responsible for, for what they're putting out there. How would you recycle that material to even begin with? Of course, you can still grind it, And there's different ways that you can separate materials. It is possible, but why would you sell something with the idea that this is quote unquote more sustainable when it actually is harder to recycle when a lot of times it's still single use, you know? So I think that's one of the worst crimes that I've seen more recently. And people ne really need to look out for that and think about what does it truly mean when people are saying that it is better or sustainable? You got to look at the data. You got to understand the materials, where things are coming from, where are things manufactured, how are they manufactured. Things need to be done to a certain standard. Things need to be followed by a general thought of how things are really going to work out at the end, because it's all about accountability, accountability of the packaging itself, all about the things that you're producing, the things that you're buying as a consumer, accountability of those manufacturers and companies that are selling that in the first place. <laughs>
Tell me something about eco-design that's true that almost nobody agrees with you on. I think that the whole idea about plastic not being a villain, there's a good number of people that would agree with me, but I think the general census is always, oh my God, how could you say that? And I totally understand that there is a ton of plastic and plastic derivatives that are being put into our waste streams, you know, and it's something that we really need to take a hold on. But I, I don't think that the material itself can be held as a villain. I, I do think also that as consumers, it is important that we do our due diligence and pressure. Companies are really responsible responsible for waste and for the inequity and discrepancies that we're seeing in the world today. Things really need to take to heart and research and put pressure on that. But as consumers also, it's important to do your part. Of course, it has a much lesser footprint than changing a whole production system, but it's still important to understand. And, and I think that's maybe a really good learning curve right there is understanding the materials and production methods as a start and starting to do certain changes also on your way of life. That's not the only solution, but I think that's another way that we need to tackle this problem as well on the individual and on the collective. What do you think are those two or three concepts or ideas that most designers have deeply rooted in our heads and that we should think about erasing completely in a short period of time? I think we really need to let go of aesthetics before function. Nothing irritates me more as a consumer <laughs> than having something that's beautiful, but it doesn't work as expected or it doesn't last as long. It's actually really important for us as designers to also start testing the products for the durability and also designing for modularity. That's another big piece that I don't see enough out there is designing things that you can easily fix yourself and maybe you can sell the spare parts. We need to let go of the aesthetic before function. We really need to start designing for modularity and design for taking things apart in order for them to be recycled. So I, I think those are the three big pieces that we're still missing. Jasmine, do you think that we packaged designers are sometimes garbage designers? <laughs> But that's definitely the reality for most of us, right? I think I'm fortunate enough that I can say I am not, but it, it is true. And it's really sad too, right? Because something went wrong. When you see Apple designing that beautiful packaging, that, that entire unboxing experience, so many companies, so many designers are into that right now is the unboxing experience. And it's such a beautiful presentation and how it snaps or whatever sound it makes, whatever tactile experience you have, you know, it's sometimes even better than the actual product, right? But then still you take that cardboard plastic packaging and you throw it away. And again, a lot of times those things are not even recycled. But yeah, I do think that a lot of times packaging is a beautiful garbage. <laughs> nice title. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, garbage, garbage uh, made to be beautiful, you know? <laughs> Jasmine, what's your next adventure? I am still so enamored with materials and discovering what reusability and the circular economy means within my expertise of design. I kind of fell into packaging design and fell in love with it, but I know that there's also so much more. You know, it's supply chain is super interesting to me. I'm just really in love, you know. <laughs> with uh, this challenge and, and making it work and, and hopefully inspiring people along the way as well. I'm, I'm really excited for collaboration, partnerships that, that are coming up and, and just thinking about how I can work better together. I think that's one of the biggest pieces that I have and hopefully with as many industries as I can. What I really want is to really solve the question mark that I have in my head, you know, about circular systems and materials and, and as many challenges that I can. Jasmine, thank you so much for this talk. You made me feel that I was in your boat. Perhaps it's more like Jasmine's ark that's trying to save us. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. This was amazing. And thank you so much for these very sensible questions. I think we're definitely on the right path if we keep questioning and thinking about this issue. I hope you have enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. You can check the episode notes for all the relevant links. I also invite you to follow me on Instagram and on my website, branderman.design. Follow the podcast in your favorite app so you don't miss the next episode of Branderman, the podcast where we try to uncover how to make a positive impact on consumers, the market and society through package design. <laughs>